Hey, good evening, everybody. How's it going? All right, good. This is lovely. This is great. Um, very, very cool. Uh, always what I wanted to be, also what I wanted to do is, is be a, a performer. And what I'm going to discuss in our time together is a lot of what that was like. Uh, but I want to say at the top that this is much nicer than most of the places that I've performed <laughs> over the last 17 years. I was sitting in the audience looking this way, thinking, what a great shape of a room. And then I just stood up, and there's a whole different shape on the other side. Very cool. Very, very cool. And so I always wanted to perform. Initially, I thought I wanted to be a magician, uh, only because I didn't know the word comedian. Well, eventually, I did learn it. I did learn the word comedian. And I decided that that was what I wanted to be, also that I don't have the patience or the dexterity for card tricks. So. Comedy is where, where we ended up. Uh, as an adult, I found myself in Arizona. Beautiful state, not a lot of people there, not the population density that typically lends itself to being successful in stand-up comedy or any other type of performance, but it took me years to figure that out. I thought, I'll just be so funny, they'll come to me. <laughs> this was a huge mistake. So 18 years old, I start performing, and I'm performing in like coffee shops while people are trying to do their college homework. I come bursting out. I'm booked. They booked me to be on the show. They said, we want you to come in and do an hour of material. I said, okay, great. What if, in the year 2003, I come out dressed as Quetzalcoatl from Aztec Legend and start screaming and yelling at people doing their homework? And they said, sure, we're giving you two free cups of coffee. Do whatever you want for an hour. <laughs> so that's what I did. Uh, I did that sort of thing. I would play punk rock basements. Uh, and they, they have uh, like these, these house shows in the basements of uh, these houses in Arizona. Difficult to have a basement just because of the geology, a lot of volcanic rock. So when you actually got a basement, it was really, really exciting to be down there. I would find myself, I would find myself on, on bills. They wouldn't put me on the cool punk rock bands. Like, well, we're gonna, you're gonna be doing jokes, so we're gonna have like a slam poet, and we're gonna have a, a continental European performance troupe. They're gonna throw fireworks at the audience for 20 minutes. And then you go up and tell some jokes. Okay, great. In a smoke-filled room, in a basement, with a trap door. People are trying to smoke and the cigarettes are going out because there isn't enough oxygen. You, Jackson, tell some jokes. So I did this for years. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out how to get out of my own way. And uh, yeah, I was dating around and trying to figure out who I was and working a lot of odd jobs, uh, doing a lot of sweeping and ditch digging, that sort of thing. And then I decided that I would go to the United Kingdom. My mother's family is English. That's why I have this impeccable diction and wear cardigans all year. <laughs> so I went to go stay with my mother's family in the UK. And by this point, I've been trying to do comedy for maybe three years, three and a half years. Not much success in the United States. There was one stand-up comedy club in Phoenix, which was a, a big city, 150 miles away from where I lived in this small town. 150 miles each way. Uh, they asked me to do a showcase one time. I went on there, I wore a suit. I got some pretty good laughs. They said, please never come back. I said, okay, I'm leaving this country. So I went to the UK. I'm staying with my family, and it was great. Immediately. Shockingly great. Uh, I had uh, an album, if I can call it that, I will. I had an album that I recorded uh, in the back of an Italian restaurant after they closed. I think there were 11 or 12 people there. I mostly talked about action figures and the then brand new, Fo brand new Fox News channel. Uh, this went on for about an hour. The audio was not very good. It was just one part of a channel off of a high eight camera. It didn't sound good at all. There weren't really any jokes, but it was all that I had, and I sent it around to these clubs in the UK. Like, we love it. We want to pay you 60 bucks. Come down to an hour. I was like, okay, sure. So I went, and that was great. Uh, going to, I went to this place in, in Birmingham, which is one of the largest cities in the United Kingdom, a couple million people there. And uh, their big stand-up comedy club is called the Glee Club. You know that because when you look at the stage, there are 12-foot letters that say Glee behind you when you stand there. And I went there with a friend just to watch a show. This girl, uh, Christina Huff, she uh, lives in Australia now. Um, and I'm totally over her, it's fine. But uh, so we went, <laughs> we went to go see the show at the Glee Club 20 years ago. I went to go see the show at the Glee Club, and I was just sitting in the audience, and the host came out, and he said, are there any Americans in the audience? And she elbowed me and stuck her hand up and did this kind of gesture. And I said, that's not fair. I have a British passport. I spell color with a U. Uh, everyone picks on me in the United States. They don't like me there either. And so the, the guy who was hosting, he said, oh, now what do you do? And I said, well, I'm an entertainer. Oh, an entertainer? Oh, excuse me, everybody. Big laugh from the crowd. And 
I said, well, what's your name? And I said, my name's Jeff Jackson. He went, oh, Jeff Jackson. <laughs> okay, we just wanted the first name. But Jeff Jackson, very good, very good. Another big laugh. What do you think of the show so far? And I went, because it hadn't been that great. I didn't understand what a host was supposed to do. I thought, this guy's not very, very funny. He's not dressing up like what's a cop. He's not throwing any fireworks. He's just standing there asking people, like, are you from out of town? Are you having a birthday? Any anniversaries? Any big parties? Okay. Big round of applause for your next performer. He wasn't being funny, which was his job. The host of a comedy show is not really supposed to be funny. They're just supposed to be nice and welcoming. That also took me years to figure out. I had to get fired as a host a few times, and then, oh, right. <clears throat> it's work. So the show goes on, and all the acts come out, and as they all come out, they're like, oh, what does Jeff Jackson think of this joke? Is this going okay? And they're like, oh, big laugh. I'm like, oh, Jeff Jackson, what do you think of this? I was wearing a three-piece suit and a big felt hat, so it was pretty easy to spot me in the crowd. This went on for a couple of hours. The show wraps up. My friend Christina Hoff, who I'm totally over, says, you should go talk to somebody about performing here. I said, Christina, that's not the way comedy works. You have to labor away in the dark, in basements and coffee shops for years. They ignore you. Eventually, they'll give you three or four minutes. They won't give you any money. And then 20 years later, maybe you can do like a half hour for Comedy Central. And she said, yeah, but what if you just tried? What if you just tried? So I went up to the bartender, the first person I could find. I said, excuse me, my name's Jeff Jackson. He said, oh my goodness, Jeff Jackson. Yes, of course. <laughs> We've been talking about you all night. What can we do for you? And I said, well, I, I do comedy. He said, yes, yes, we all know you do comedy. Uh, and I said, how would I go about performing here? He said, hold on a minute. I'll go, I'll go get the general manager. This is the manager of a comedy club in a large city, in a, a, a populous nation. So, it's a big deal. He comes back a minute later. He says, yeah, sure, she'll see you. Walks me right back into the general manager's place. She's got papers everywhere and a billboard with all the people that they're booking. And she says, ah, oh, yes, Jeff Jackson, I've been hearing about you all night. What can I do for you? <laughs> And I said, I'd love to perform at this club. And she said, great. Uh, here's my email, here's my card. Email me when you're available, we'll find some time for you. She has not heard any of my jokes. As I'm leaving, she's like, oh, if you've got like a recording, send that or whatever if you want to. So I sent her my terrible album, which she listened to, and said, that's not very good, but we'd still like to have you come back on a Friday night and do 15 minutes for us in the middle of the show, which takes years to get that kind of thing. And I got it just by showing up and wearing a suit. Uh, which is never, this is not the way that my life is typically structured. So I go and I do the set, and it goes over well. I get a lot of laughs. And I'm, I'm backstage, and all the guys that have been in the, on the show in the green room, kind of like, what's this kid's deal? Does he have an agent who got this gig? What, you just showed up three weeks ago? This is crazy, this doesn't work. He's gonna suck, and I went out and I didn't suck. So then I'm in the green room afterwards, elated, very excited, wearing a different suit, no hat. And the, the night manager, guy running the show that night, he comes back, his name was Aiden, he said, that was incredible, we'd love to have you back anytime. This is what's called being passed, meaning that if I'm in the area and I want to drop by and do a few minutes, they will put me on pretty much any time. And I said to him, Aiden, you know, that's really great, thank you so much for that, but I've decided I'm going to move back to Arizona and get married and become a gentleman farmer in the style of Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> And he said, what? <laughs> I said, well, not, not exactly about Thomas Jefferson. There'll be some noticeable differences about the way we organize the labor, but I'm going to move. <laughs> I'm going to move to this small town. It's called Cornville, C-O-R-N-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. And I'm going to be a farmer down there. I'm very much in love. I'm going to marry this girl. And he said, are you sure? <laughs> Just like that, very intense. Yeah, yeah, I've never been so sure of anything in all my life. I said, okay, well, goodbye. And I left. I, uh, I haven't been booked at a comedy club since. That was 2005. Uh, so I go back to Arizona. I move to Cornville. I get married. We get married down by a river. My mother does all of the cooking. My grandfather does a great toast. Uh, I start planting vegetables. We grow several types of tomatoes. We grow sorghum and uh, sunflowers and all kinds of different melons and ornamental gourds and uh, all manner of things. Nasturtiums and marigolds, it goes on and on and on and on. Everything's really great for a couple of seasons, 2005, 2006. We get to the fall of 2007 and a swarm of grasshoppers came and devoured all of my crops and they ate all of my tomatoes. They ate my 2001 Chevy Cavalier. They ate my house. They ate my marriage. Uh, 
This was the fall of 2007. It started in June of 2007, went all the way through to Christmas Day 2009. It was a very rough period for everyone involved. All my friends were getting divorced. Not all of the grasshoppers to devour, but they, they did. The marriage fell apart. I thought, man, hmm, maybe I'll try this uh, comedy thing again. So I started doing comedy again in the same kind of like small, small venues, but this time I brought more stuff. Now I'm going to dress up like Master Shredder from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now I'm going to bring the sorghum that I grew. I'm going to put it behind me and people are like, oh, you grew that sorghum. You must be really good at telling jokes. It didn't help. It didn't help. Eventually, you know, when, when, when the fall ended and we survived the winter that then went from Christmas of 2009 to about the early summer of 2011, uh, I moved. I left Arizona. I said, what if I went to a place with more than 400 people in a town? What if I moved to a place where it's less than 150 miles in a car to the next venue? I hear Philadelphia has an airport, and I've considered flying through it. Um, we better move there. So I moved to Philadelphia, and that was nearly seven years ago now. And it seems to be going pretty well, because we're all here. You know? <laughs> This is happening at the moment, so. Looking out. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much, Jeff. And thanks to all of you for coming out to I Want to Be, stories inspired by Jerry Pinckney here at the Woodmere Art Museum. A few quick notes before we go. Um, thank you to uh, Hildy Tao from Woodmere, uh, Christina Warhola also from the Woodmere Art Museum, Danielle Marino and the staff at First Person Arts, uh, Dorian Vasquez, and thank you to all of you for joining us this evening. You're all invited to a reception in the historic galleries immediately following the show, uh, and you're welcome to wander through the galleries as well. Uh, we appreciate your support with Live Local Storytellers, and we hope to hear one of your stories soon. Yes? Yeah, um... set up for that, could we, well, uh, Jamie, do you want to, Jamie, do you actually do you want to come up and say a few words as well? Oh, no, I, no. Yeah. Please welcome Jamie Brunson, Executive Director of First Person Art. Jeff, we are so glad you're in Philadelphia. Vara, you and the dogs, okay? And everyone else, you're wonderful. Um, so let me see a show of hands, and don't be polite, okay? Do, what's your name, darling? Verlia. Ver? Verlia. Okay, so uh, how many people are willing to stay and let Verlia share with us? Okay, so for Leah, you, we're going we're gonna to have you share, but I'm going to ask you to keep it to three minutes. Now, can you do that? Give her five. Give her five? Okay, can you keep it to five? You're going to keep it to Because you are fabulous. Come on up here with the, with the, with the, come on. Come on, mama. Fabulous stuff. You go keep it to five, right? Okay. All right, and, and, and you're going to have to leave that, that blouse here with me because that's that. <laughs> Brighter if we could do this. 
And this story is called The Love Shell. And it's a story of true forgiveness. Now, most of the story tells us, I see here, you guys don't have any notes. I was hoping I had a stand or something, but it's okay, I, I know. So I'll just have to read it. Okay, I'll start. Just a minute. Just a minute. Even as a child, I loved the beach. For several years, I spent many fun-filled summer days with my family at the seashore. My parents, uncles, aunts, and cousins loaded up their cars with bikes, luggage, beach bags, and everything else that was needed for a wonderful day at the seashore. I couldn't wait to get to the beach. As soon as possible, I dived into the water, jumping waves and swimming like a happy fish. These memories make me smile. Then one day I started to collect seashells. You see, my Uncle Harris made collecting seashells very special because he won contests for finding the most unusual and attractive shells. My cousin and I wanted to be winners like Uncle Harrison, so we competed with each other to see who could find the most beautiful shells. No one ever found one worthy of winning a contest, but we all tried. It was fun. Then one day, an especially large, beautiful, cone-shaped shell washed ashore. It was gold and white, with bright pink and copper lives, lines curling all around it from top to bottom. When I saw this amazing shell, I ran quickly over to pick it up. As I was running, I noticed that one of my cousins and his best friend, Robbie, saw it too. For a minute, there was a mad scramble in the stand to get this shell. And I was the smallest and youngest, but I won. The shell was mine. When Uncle Harris saw it, he exclaimed, Tina, this is one of the sure winners. He promised to enter it into the final seashell contest of the season. I was so proud and happy, this memory makes me smile. But the smile was soon to turn into a tearful sigh because the day before I was to enter my seashell in the contest, it went missing at the beach. Frantically, I looked around. I thought I put it in my beach bag, but it wasn't there. I asked myself, did I drop it? Did it fall out of the bag? I enlisted the help of my family. We looked all over for it. It was not in the wet sand or dry sand or under blankets or beach bags. It was nowhere to be found. We finally had to give up. My only comfort as we left the beach was the friendly concern of Robbie, my cousin's friend. He looked harder than anyone else and really cared how badly I felt. This memory makes me sigh because I was very sad and disappointed. Then something happened that was even worse than losing the shell. One afternoon, while Robbie was cleaning out his beach bag, he accidentally dropped it and my seashell fell out. I was shocked. I quickly grabbed it and held it up to his face. Robbie, this is my seashell. You had it all along, you stole it, you stole it, and now it's too late to enter it into the contest. And everyone was staring at us in unbelief. Robin looked down in shame and banged the door shut as he ran upstairs. I was so angry I vowed I'll never speak to that thief again. This memory makes me sigh. Robbie apologized the next day, but I just wasn't going to hear it. It's only a seashell, I heard my, my other cousin yell. It's just a seashell, who cares about that? It's my seashell, I shouted back. It belonged to me. And if you're on Robbie's side, I'm not speaking to you anymore. 
Nevertheless, to say, nevertheless, it was the most uncomfortable summer with my family. I just couldn't forgive Robbie, even though he apologized again and asked me to forgive him. But like to see memories and time move on. Eight years later, I was 16. I was generally happy, looking forward to graduation, and my relationship with my parents was pretty good. But there was a family rule that annoyed me. I was never allowed to have company when my parents were not at home, and I never did. Nevertheless, it annoyed me. I often thought, who do they think I am? Some irresponsible little kid. So one Saturday night, mom and dad had a class reunion to attend and they would be gone for several hours. I said to myself, Tina, you've been a pretty good kid for a long time. <laughs> Having a little get together isn't a big deal. So I invited a few close friends, just five, for a little get together. But the news that I was having friends over turned into, hey, everybody, Tina's having a big party Saturday night. That news traveled around the neighborhood like wildfire. I ended up with 30 kids in my house partying, raiding our refrigerator, and ordering masses of food from the deli. I soothed my conscience by reminding myself that I had been a pretty good kid for a long time. And breaking a rule once wouldn't be the end of the world. Besides, we were having a good time and I felt popular. Now I didn't have alcohol, but a couple of kids brought their own and shared it. Soon the party turned some kind of weird, unexpected, crazy corner. Food and drinks landed on the floor and furniture. A couple of kids started throwing plastic bottles all over and making everybody duck. The music and laughter got louder and louder. The dancing got really crazy. Someone bumped into the china cabinet and broke a fancy dish that my mother had as a wedding present. It happened to be her favorite. I tried to control things, but nobody was listening to me. Seeing my distress, a few of my friends told me they would help me clean up the mess. They assured me that my parents would return to an orderly, spotlessly clean house. Oh well, I thought, nothing was beyond fixing or hiding, if necessary. So, party hard. Everything is going to be okay. I soothed my conscience again by reminding myself, Tina, you've been a pretty good kid for a long time. Enjoy yourself. Then suddenly, like a monster jumping out of a bad dream into reality, something really terrible happened. Mike, the local daredevil de devil decided to jump from the top of the second floor landing to the bottom floor because he was sure of his new identity, which was Superman. He thought he could fly down. When I saw him starting to take this ridiculous jump, I yelled, no, Mike, cut that out. If you hurt yourself, I'm in trouble. You're not even supposed to be here. Mike just laughed and started reciting something from the cat in the hat in a silly, high-pitched voice. Tell that cat in the hat we do not want to play. He should not be here. He should not be about. He should not be here when your mother is out. Everyone started roaring with laughter until we slowly realized Mike was not really sober and Mike really jumped. The laughter faded away as Mike swayed at the top of the steps. His best friend, Billy, started slowly up the steps to cook him down. He pleaded with Mike in a soft, calm voice, but it was too late. Mike yelled, Superman, and spread out his arms like wings and jumped. It's difficult to speak about what happened after that. Mike broke his leg and lay writhing in pain at the bottom of the stairs, screaming. As he fell, his friend who started up the steps to bring him down was knocked hard against the banister and tumbled down the steps like a bag of wet sand. He lay motionless on the floor with his eyes closed while everyone ran fearfully over to peer down at him. Then someone suddenly screamed, Oh my God, he's dead! In panic, my friends began to run, pushing and squeezing out the front door. Only three were brave enough to stay, 
with me kneeling down beside the two injured boys, we called 911 and for the next few minutes, sirens screamed and red lights beamed as two ambulances and a police car came speeding up to my house. Neighbors were peeping out of the doors and windows and running outside to see what madness had descended on this usually sane and peaceful home. This was the incredible scene that greeted my mom and dad as they pulled up behind the ambulance with the boys on stretchers. We followed the ambulances and police car when my, with my parents to the hospital. I'd never seen my parents so angry. In the car, they shouted over and over, how could you do this? How could you? You know you're not supposed to have company when we're out. Suppose Billy is dying or dead. Suppose Mike never walks normally again. I was huddled in the back seat, shaking and crying. Nevertheless, we were blessed. Mike would recover after a few weeks in a cast, and Billy was, not, was only unconscious, not dead. He would be fine. After a silence which seemed to last forever, when we arrived home, Mom looked over the table where we kept family memorabilia. We called it the treasure place. She walked over and picked up something that had not been touched in years. It was my seashell, the beautiful one I found years before. She came over to me and held it up to my face, just as I had once held it up to Robbie's face. She said, I would love to forgive you, Tina, but you have a debt to pay first. Oh, I replied, suddenly wondering what she meant. I'll clean up the mess, Mom. I'll use my allowance to pay for the broken dish, and I'll, and she interrupted me, shaking her head and looking deeply into my eyes. Tina, I'm not concerned about the dish and mess. I'm concerned about you and this seashell. What do you, what do you mean, I asked. Now my dad entered the conversation. Tina, you made Robbie miserable one summer because he stole this seashell, even though he asked you to forgive him. He's a friend of the family, and everyone else forgave him, but you refused. You've been mean to him ever since. Not only that, but you have tried very hard to make other people dislike him. I yelled out, but he's a, uh, and I wanted to say thief. But the words wouldn't come out, because I looked at the hurt in my parents' eyes, and I realized their trust had been stolen, and I was the thief. I thought about Mike and Billy's injuries and how truly tragic it could have been. As I leaned against the door when I went into my room, I began to think, did I need to forgive in order to be forgiven? Did I need to be forgiven for my unforgiveness? In these moments, Jesus' teaching about the importance of forgiveness, which I often heard in church, became very real. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Suddenly a picture came to my mind of many people locked in cells of unforgiveness by relatives, friends, acquaintances, and sometimes even themselves. Eight years ago I vowed I would never speak to Robbie again. Today I'm vowing to let him out of the shell of the jail that I put him in. He that is without sin casts the first stone. My stones turned into keys that unlock jail cells. The next words I spoke were at breakfast. I said, Mom, Dad, I called Robbie and he forgave me. Robbie forgave me. They looked at me a little puzzled at first, but then I explained. They exchanged, we exchanged the gift of forgiveness. I forgave him for stealing my seashell, and he forgave me for locking him up for years in my prison of unforgiveness. While they both smiled, Dad said, Tina, if we're starting, if you're starting a forgiveness club, we'd like to join. We held hands around the table and thanked God for his forgiveness. This memory makes me smile. Now as a woman, several years later, I've learned to forgive and 
be forgiven many times, it has always made both the giver and receiver of forgiveness happier, better people, and it's always helped me to forgive myself. Smile when you forgive. You've opened up your heart. Now you can live in a peaceful place where you can sow seeds of grace that grow and grow into a love that cannot fail. Well, enough remembering for today. I'm standing here now at the water's edge on the same beach where I found the seashell. My two beautiful children and wonderful husband are run, running out of the water toward me, laughing and splashing. As they come close to me, I open up my arms and embrace them. Then to my wonderful husband's ear, I whisper, Robbie, I love you. And thank you all for coming out to the event this evening here at the Woodmere Art Museum. I want to be stories inspired by Jerry Pickney. We'll see you all in the historic galleries for the reception. Thank you again for coming. And he's still fat as shit. <laughs> <laughs> they're just like, why is that funny? I don't understand. <laughs> It's that is so funny. Funny. It's so funny. Dude, it's I, so funny. It's so funny. I gave him. I've been so fat that no one noticed he walked on <laughs> Trump. <laughs> I gave him the, yeah. on the tour. I gave him the funniest <laughs> joke because we were like we were buying food and like cooking it mm -hmm. on the road. And we were eating spinach. He's like, I'm just gonna put more ranch on the. If he's like, I put too much ranch. I guess I'll just get more spinach. I'm like, you found the fattest way to be healthy. <laughs> <laughs> it works. <laughs> <laughs> that joke crushes every time. Uh, <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> 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 fucking obese dope. <laughs> like a monster. <laughs> Just eating slop like a damn beast. <laughs> My blood is so thin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never gonna have a heart attack. <laughs> never. You, what you did is you just got depressed and worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you stopped eating mm -hmm. your feelings yeah. with bad food. Now you're just eating with health. Good food, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're eating like a fucking sea turtle. <laughs> I just imagine Lamar as a fat giraffe. <laughs> just like the neck is thick. <laughs> You've got a gun in your neck. It's just like a stomach <laughs> on her neck. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the legs are neat. It doesn't even look tall anymore. No. It's just stops. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. That's real fat giraffe. There's a, what is that next to that tiny tree? <laughs> Your legs are on the sides. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> All right. Oh my god. So I supposed to pull up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been rolling for All a right. minute, I think. Fuck yeah. I'm gonna, <laughs> All right. I'm gonna do some, uh, some fucking... Here. Oh, ow, fuck. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> you know, the shirt's, shirt's staying on. I couldn't get it over my glasses. Give Whoa. it up for this episode of Shamed AF. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You gotta do at least four. Four pull-ups. Four pull-ups uh, for our last four subscribers. Yep. All right. I appreciate you. Thank you. One. Thank you. Two. Hell yeah. Thank you. Three. Get it, Crick. Thank you. <laughs> uh oh. Oh, look at that. Oh, uh -oh. oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. I'm telling you. Napoleon Complex will get everything done. It's the best. <coughs> this is how great the Napoleon Complex is. I want to do those pull ups now because fuck Crick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the. It's the first exercise I've done in like five weeks. <laughs> you like, oh, I'm gonna be sore all week now. Yeah. You look so yeah. tired. <laughs> you just throw up. My glasses are 
fucked up. <laughs> it would actually be funny if every time you came to the top, you just threw up more. Yeah. <laughs> Swole AF. Hell yeah, dude. Swole AF. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. Sweet. Hell yeah. I don't know what to grab. <laughs> to, uh, yeah. You can get one. No, I can't. <laughs> no. <laughs> We've already tried this. I thought you were going to and you just take the bar down. Like, I'll just clean up now. 